Thanks, Emil. It's, uh, again, a privilege for me to be here. This is such an important area of challenge uh, and opportunity at the same time. And I'm very grateful for the efforts you and so many have made to put this together. Uh, I have had a chance to be with you in the previous two sessions, and we've already gotten into issues around biomarkers and uh, the challenges that we face in being able to justify that treatment effects on those biomarkers reliably predict treatment effects on clinical endpoints. I'm going to revisit some of the comments I've already made, but I'd like to also refine what I've said in the past in the context of an important meeting that took place three weeks ago on October 19th. Uh, at White Oak, where FDA had coordinated a, a session under the leadership of Lori Burke and Mark Walton in characterization of outcome measures. Uh, and I'll, I'll be folding those thoughts into what I'm going to say today. So very quickly, and I apologize if I go quickly, but I want to keep us on schedule. And, and I've had a chance to discuss with many of you a number of these issues before. There are many important characteristics, and by the way, the slides we can make available after the session, since this will be going fast. <clears throat> many important characteristics of endpoints, well-defined and reliable, we want to know they have content validity. Do these measures, in fact, reliably address what it is that uh, they are purported to address? We want them to be sensitive to important benefits that these patients may be achieving. Really key characteristic, the measures ideally should be clinically meaningful and as Bob Temple defined a clinically meaningful endpoint as a direct measure of how a patient functions, feels, and survives. As I always say, what is it that the patient specifically would define they wish to achieve in addressing their disease? And so if we use, I'll use PKU, one of the rare disease, important rare disease settings, to illustrate points as I go along here today. There are many ways in which patients with rare disease can be benefited. When we talk about functions, I'm not talking about physiologic functions. Uh, we're talking about the ability of the patient to carry out normal activities, addressing school difficulties, work difficulties, feels, uh, addressing uh, aspects of how they feel, angry outbursts, uh, poor social relationships, etc. A number of these measures can best be assessed by a physician or an observer looking at things like job losses or poor work attendance. But a number of them are best, uh, best assessed by patient reported outcomes that we got into with some depth at the last meeting. Uh, the patient needs to report features such as loneliness, anxiety, depression. And the, the FDA in December of 09 came forward with their guidance on patient reported outcomes. Any report of the status of a patient's health condition that comes directly from the patient without interpretation of the patient's response by a clinician or anyone else would be characterized as a patient-reported outcome. <laughs> there are many different characteristics that have to be assessed and established for patient-reported outcomes, reliability, sensitivity, content and construct, validity, clinical relevance, interpretability. I want to spend a little time on integrity. Uh, typically, if it's an, a, a very objective endpoint, uh, if it's survival, for example, an unblinded trial would not be problematic. But for many of these patient-reported outcome or symptom-based outcomes, doing, making this assessment in a blinded way is critical to the integrity uh, to reduce the risk of bias. Control of missing data, always important, very important in these. If we're randomizing to an experimental and a standard therapy, once the person stops their randomized treatment, it's important to continue to follow. The distinction between adherence to the therapy and retention for follow-up. So if we stop following people when they stop their randomized treatment, it's going to induce a significant amount of informative missingness. And adjustment for multiplicity. As I've mentioned, SF36, eight domains. You can't, we can't just look at many measures and choose the one that looks the best and think that we can interpret what the p-values mean and be free of random high bias. Well, it's a challenge, as we know, and we'll hear a lot more about these challenges and coming up with appropriate validated measures that we might use to assess functions and fields. And survives also may take large numbers and long duration. And so measures of biologic activity provide us an opportunity to assess effects in a more timely way and with more acceptable sample sizes and in, in uh, PKU. Uh, 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 plasma fee concentrations would be a classic potential biomarker. The Institute of Medicine a year ago came forward with an important document on biomarkers and their validation or use as replacement endpoints. 
where they characterize biomarkers very broadly as measures of biological processes, physiological measurements, blood tests, chemical analyses of tissue or bodily fluids, uh, images, uh, and genetic or metabolic data, including multidimensional signatures. Uh, at this institute, of, or rather at this FDA uh, meeting that took place three weeks ago at White Oak, uh, under the leadership, as I mentioned, of Lori Burke and Mark Walton, uh, Mark had characterized, in essence, uh, and he's here and he'll talk maybe more about this, had characterized uh, direct and indirect measures. We have direct measures of functions, feel, survives that could be assessed by the patient, the clinician, or the observer. And then we have, and we'll be very interested today, in a wide array of indirect measures. And those indirect measures, in part, may be measures that directly depend on patient motivation or clinical judgment. And, and Mark has characterized that as psychomodulated uh, endpoints. Then there are other indirect measures where there isn't such a direct dependence, and, and we'll be calling those biomarkers, and they are a huge array. We'll talk today about many such biomarkers, urine gag, urine KS, uh, plasma fee concentrations as just some of the examples of biomarkers. And as we've said, they're, they're an appeal, a very appealing approach because we want to intervene, we want to have, we want to document actual tangible benefit to patients. And we understand a fair amount, particularly in rare diseases, about the biological process through which the, the disease ultimately causally influences the clinical endpoints. So the goal often is to find a biomarker, either based on clinical data correlations or understanding of biological processes, show you have an effect on that biomarker that is correlated with the clinical endpoint, and then I often say make the leap of faith that the effect on the biomarker reliably predicts the effect on the clinical endpoint. And unfortunately, as we say, a correlate does not a surrogate make. There are many examples where even though the biomarker may be part of the causal pathway that induces the clinical outcomes or is correlated with the clinical outcomes, the effect on the biomarker does not reliably predict an effect on the clinical endpoint in many instances. So to quickly review these ideas that we've talked about in previous meetings, a disease process can causally induce what we care about in patients. It can causally induce an effect on a biomarker, and as a result, it wouldn't be surprising that the biomarker is correlated with the clinical endpoint. But if the biomarker is not in this yellow pathway, this principal pathophysiologic pathway through which the disease process influences a clinical endpoint, the effect on the biomarker may not reliably predict the effect on the clinical endpoint. And a classic example, if you have an infected woman with HIV, uh, the clinical endpoint here is preventing transmission to her infant. The lower her CD4 count, the, the more powerfully likely it'll be that she will transmit HIV to her infant. So we'll treat her with IL-2 in the eighth and ninth months, spike her CD4 count one to 200 cells. It will have no effect on transmission. What we would have had to, have, what we should have, what we needed to do was reduce the viral load by one or two or three orders of magnitude in order to reduce this risk of transmission. In the oncology setting, we have many biomarkers. Uh, Prostate-specific antigen is strongly correlated with prostate cancer symptoms and death. And as a result, just being correlate is good enough to be useful for diagnosing prostate cancer and for assessing prognosis. But certainly, prostate cancer patients don't, in fact, get symptoms and death mediated through an elevation of their PSA. So it makes it, in fact, a relatively poor choice as a replacement endpoint. Direct measures of tumor burden, if sufficiently comprehensive, would typically be better choices. Now, I, I would think, m my sense is in rare diseases, typically the biomarkers that we're looking at are in causal pathways. And yet the disease process may induce the clinical outcome mediated through multiple pathways. And if the biomarker does not lie in a principal cause, so if the yellow pathway is a very principal causal pathway, for how the disease influences the clinical outcome, and the biomarker does not lie in that pathway, then effects of an intervention on the biomarker could either induce false positive or false negative conclusions. And an example of the false negative conclusions we talked about before is the rare disease setting in children, chronic granulomatous disease, where in this setting, uh, the clinical endpoint is the prevention of recurrent serious infections. And gamma interferon was of interest some time ago. 
And it was planned to do a study of these kids that would be smaller, short term, looking to show an effect in the biomarker of bacterial killing and superoxide production. Fortunately, the trial was done to be of sufficient size to directly also assess the effect on the clinical endpoint of recurrent infections because the intervention actually was very successful with a 70% reduction in the clinical endpoint, and yet surprising to, to most of us, it had essentially no effect on the, on the biomarkers that were at one point the planned endpoints for the trial. So gamma interferon did in fact provide clinical benefit either on bacterial killing at a strong enough level to have the clinical benefit, but at a low enough level not to be detected, or it had it through, its effect was through another pathway such as uptake of antibiotics. False positives are a great risk. If you have an MI, you want to re restore blood flow quickly to prevent the risk of 30-day mortality. And agents were available. TPA was a standard of, standard of care. Interest was in looking at a different thrombolytic, RPA. RPA was compared to TPA in the RAPID2 trial. RPA was found to be better in restoring blood flow at 60 and 90 minutes. Well, fortunately, a clinical endpoint trial was done, GUSTO3, randomizing large numbers to RPA and TPA to directly look at their relative effect in the clinical endpoint. And it turned out that, in fact, RPA wasn't better than TPA on what patients cared about, which was 30-day mortality. So we went back and looked at RAPID2, and then when we looked at RAPID2 again, we found, well, yeah, well, it was true that RPA was better in getting TIMI3 blood flow at 60 and 90 minutes, but TPA was better at 30 minutes. And so one of the challenges that we're going to face here is that it will be the case in rare disease settings that, for example, in PKU, that we'll have very good biomarkers that in fact are on the causal pathway, and this may in fact be the yellow causal pathway, the principal causal pathway, even when they are. What is the magnitude of the effect on, on plasma phi levels? And what's the durability of that effect that we have to achieve to meaningfully alter endpoints in this setting such as cognitive function? What is that magnitude? What is that durability? And how do you know? Well, even if the intervention has the intended effects, on all of the causal pathways that are important for how the disease process influences outcomes. It's not uncommon for an intervention that's potent enough to do what we want it to do to also have off-target effects that can directly affect outcome. And classic example, many of you know, if you have an MI and you have an arrhythmia, you're at much enhanced risk for sudden death. Well, we can give echinite and flecainite and suppress those arrhythmias. Pretty potent argument that if you, you want to suppress those arrhythmias to presumably reduce the risk of mortality, between 250,000 and 500,000 people a year followed this logic and were treated with echinite and flecainite to suppress those arrhythmias. Until finally, the placebo-controlled CAS trial, 2,000 people were randomized to show that, in fact, while echinite and flecainite do suppress arrhythmias, immediated through that may have some effect, ultimately, the intervention was tripling the death rate because we weren't, in fact, identifying unintended off-target effects by looking at the on-target effects. Biomarkers are particularly good at identifying whether or not we're having the effect on what we intend to do. But ultimately, interventions often have unintended effects as well. And there are many such examples. Erythropoietin-stimulating agents have been used in end-stage renal disease. They're also used in chemo-induced anemia in order to normalize hematocrit, uh, and yet these agents increased thrombosis and hence increased mortality. COX-2 inhibitors in OARA patients, selective NSAIDs allowing us to achieve pain relief without unintended off-target effects on GI ulceration. Uh, rosaglitazone, type 2 diabetes agents that are good in normalizing hemoglobin A1C but agents that provide symptom benefit and agents that provide the biologic effects in both of these cases have evidence that they are increasing cardiovascular risk and ultimately sub substantially altering their benefit to risk profile. Tisabri, a very potent agent in Crohn's disease and in MS, in, uh, unfortunately has an, uh, an important increase in progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Torcetrapid, can we, in fact, improve on a torvastatin and the statins in better increasing HDL and lowering LDL to have better effects on lipids? Yes, we can. 
But unfortunately, tercetropid, when added to atorvastatin, activated the renin-angiotensin system, increasing blood pressure, which may be, and we're not sure what the, whether this was, but this is potentially what was the causal factor to ultimately what was an increase in mortality, even though we were helping lipids. Triglitazone increased hepatic risks, uh, long-acting beta agonists increased uh, asthma-related deaths, Vitorin blocks pathways that are important for cancer prevention. Many, many, many examples. Cardiology often takes a hit here because so many of the examples are in cardiology. It's not because cardiologists aren't astute. It's actually because cardiologists are astute. Cardiology is a field where we have particularly aggressively assured that we're looking not just at the effect of the biomarker, but the effect on the clinical endpoint. And when we have done so, so often we found out that, in fact, that we don't have the whole story by simply understanding the effects of the biomarker. So how do we go about validating a biomarker so that the net effect on, the, on this replacement endpoint is reliably predicting what we care about, which is clinically meaningful benefit to patients in the manner that a patient would characterize, not in the manner of what the caregiver or physician would characterize, what the patient would characterize as what their goal is uh, for treatment management. So it's key to have a comprehensive understanding of the causal pathways of the disease process and the intended and unintended mechanisms. So these yellow pathways and these orange pathways, to return again, not only to understand uh, sufficiently the disease process in a manner that we know how the biomarker is capturing one of the causal pathways, but are there other principal causal pathways where the disease process is affecting the endpoint not captured by the biomarker? And not only the on-target effects, but the off-target effects. And it's obviously a tall order to understand all these orange off-target pathways and all of these yellow on-target causal pathways. Although my sense is in rare disease, we do better than we do in many clinical settings in, in being able to understand what are the causal pathways of the disease process. So we, we have genetic characterizations. It allows us to, in fact, enrich. And we'll talk more about enrichment in a minute. So in a sense, it gives us more hope for our biomarkers. But in another sense, it also allows us to do trials that could be reliable on clinical endpoints that are much smaller. So if we're dealing with a cancer drug that, in fact, is only truly benefiting a fraction of the patients, we may see a 15% improvement in response. In a rare disease setting where we can properly genetically characterize the disease process and the mechanisms of the therapy, we might be able to induce a 45% increase in response rate. Well, that reduces by a factor of 10 the sample size we need. So while we have fewer patients, we may well be able to do definitive clinical endpoint studies with one-tenth the sample size that we would need to in many clinical areas. Statistical data can also be very useful in validating a surrogate. I'll quickly give one example, and that's the setting of antihypertensives where we're using blood pressure to characterize the effects on many direct measures of clinically meaningful benefit to patients. Very quickly, the nature of the data that was presented to the Cardiorenal Advisory Committee uh, in June 2005 uh, were many studies. Each of these dots is a study, and each dot represents the relationship between the net effect of treatment on, on blood pressure. So if you're plus 10 here, it means the experimental therapy had, on average, a reduction of 10 more than the control in blood pressure. And on the y-axis was the relative reduction of the experimental to the standard on the clinical endpoints of cardiovascular event. And we find that these studies are showing that the net effect of treatment on the biomarker is predicting the net effect of treatment on the clinical endpoint. That is, in fact, the relationship that we would hope a biomarker would have when we use it to replace a clinical endpoint. Some of the uh, Daunting realities, though, this was from 500,000 patients because, as I mentioned, each dot was a trial, and each of those trials was typically a mega patient trial. Why did it take so many patients? Well, because it was realized that this validation had to be done separately for each class of antihypertensives, for low-dose diuretics, for beta blockers, for ACE inhibitors, for calcium channel blockers, for ARBs, because each class could have a different profile of off-target effects. Also, when you validate a biomarker, as was done here, it doesn't mean that blood pressure effects uniformly predict clinical benefit according to every measure. Lowering blood pressure was particularly effective as a representation of 
impact in, in, in stroke. Uh, fairly good for MI, cardiovascular death somewhat, not so good for mortality, and very poorly predicted heart failure risks. The Institute of Medicine that I've already mentioned came forward with an important document about a year ago that in essence characterized approaches to establishing use of biomarkers as replacement endpoints. And they talked about three steps. The analytical validation step relating to the analytical performance of the assay. For biomarkers, typically this step is not too difficult. The difficult step for biomarkers is what's called the qualification understanding the relationship of the biomarker with the disease and an evidence-based justification that effects on the biomarker predict clinically meaningful effects on the outcome, which is the issues that we were just talking about. It's important to point out and emphasize that biomarkers have many important uses and they're distinct uses. And I've mentioned this, but I want to stress it again. A biomarker like prostate-specific antigen and prostate cancer can be very useful to diagnose disease and assess prognosis, even if it's not on the principal causal pathway, even if it is just a correlate. They can be used in, in patient-specific therapeutic strategies. And so if, you if you're treating a patient with community-acquired pneumonia, it may be that you will use and monitor that patient's temperature in a way that, that guides your administration of antibiotics. But it's not the patient's temperature that the patient cares about if you have community-acquired pneumonia. It's addressing the symptoms. It's addressing warmth and chills, cough, breathlessness, chest pain, and ultimately survival risk. Those are the direct clinical benefits patient cares, the patient cares about. Biomarkers can be useful in proof of concept and also as supportive measures to understand what is the, what is the actual uh, effect on biological mechanisms that hopefully you would hope would influence clinical outcomes. I would argue the areas of highest clinical utility for biomarkers are first enrichment. So a classic example of this, if you have a colorectal cancer patient, you're looking at an EGFR inhibitor, there's evidence now to indicate you're not uniformly affecting all patients the same. The effect is predominantly in the KRAS wild type versus KRAS mutant population. And so biomarkers can be very helpful in a rare disease setting to help us target those patients most likely to benefit. If half the patients benefit, admittedly, your trial will only enroll half as many, and your label will only be half as large. But you can reduce by a factor of four the sample size. So there is a true efficiency gain when we can use biomarkers to characterize who are the people most likely to benefit. But it's not sufficient to characterize an enrichment by treating everybody and looking at whether or not KRAS wild type patients survive differently from mutation patients. That's a prognostic factor. And a prognostic factor does not an effect modifier make. What I want is an effect modifier. I don't want to simply know whether this genetic characteristic indicates who does better an outcome. I want to know whether it characterizes who benefits more from my treatment. And that's a much more data intensive use of the biomarker. And the other that we mentioned is while a prognostic factor does not a, an effect modifier make, as we've said, a correlate does not a surrogate make. The other obvious important way we'll talk a lot today is as a replacement endpoint. But what is the science behind being able to reliably conclude clinical benefit by looking at biomarkers? I wanted to quickly re return to this psychomodulated category. These are measures that are also indirect measures along with biomarkers that, will, that today could be of real interest to us. Measures, though, where there is a dependence on patient motivation, such as the six-minute walk or the three-minute stair climb, or in the clinician judgment, such as the decision to use rescue meds. This is not just an, a chance that we characterize these psychomodulated events here while they're indirect measures. We position them between function, feel, survive measures and biomarkers, because very often these measures are more proximal to what we ultimately want to show. So for example, while <coughs> body temperature and arrhythmia and PSA, PFS, and measures we'll talk about today, urine gag, urine KS, they are biomarkers and they are typically more distant from the direct measures. Uh, psychomodulated measures such as best corrected visual acuity, six minute walk, are measures of function that are more proximal and are more readily justified as replacement measures. 
So in essence, when we're looking at psychomodulated measures, in these settings, the qualification step often is a less burdensome step. If, I, if I'm looking at six minute walk, I am looking at, you might argue, a direct measure of that, abil of that patient's ability to function. However, it's in a somewhat artificial setting. What I really want to know is can the patient cross the street before the light changes? Can the patient carry out normal activities of daily living? But it is certainly a closer measure than many biomarkers would be. But the analytical validation step can often be a challenge. So if I'm looking at six, if I'm looking at three minute stair climb, and I'm enrolling patients from France, where it's not New York City, where we have tall buildings, we have to take all of our patients to the Eiffel Tower in order to make sure that they can all get to three minutes before they run out of stairs. So if half the patients, in fact, run out of stairs before three minutes is over. In those patients, the measure is really getting more at a burst activity as opposed to an endurance. And so the actual characteristics and analytical validation of these psychomodulated measures is, is an important challenge. So in closing, uh, <clears throat> one of the issues that the Institute of Medicine said that certainly has implications for us because can we use a validated biomarker from a non-rare disease setting and apply it in a rare disease setting? The Institute of Medicine said a replacement endpoint cannot be deemed to be a generic surrogate endpoint for a particular disease. I mean, it cannot just be readily extrapolated across settings. As for reasons we've said, multiple causal pathways. If you're looking at an anti-tumor scenario and the, the inter and the biomarker you're looking at is a tumor shrinkage or a cytotoxic measure. If the standard of care that was used to establish that, the validity of that surrogate or that biomarker, not only had cytotoxic effects but cytostatic effects, and now a new intervention only has the cytotoxic effects, its effect on the clinical endpoints mediated through a cytotoxic effect on the biomarker may not, in fact, be as reliably or as persuasively clinically important. And as we've said, magnitude and duration of the effect matters. Unintended as well as intended effects matter. Why do we care about biomarkers? Well, it's apparent that we want to deliver for our, for our patients timely access to interventions. We want to give them a choice. But the issue here, of course, is it's not just about getting a timely evaluation. It's about getting a reliable evaluation as well, because it's not just giving patients a choice. It's giving them an informed choice. And, Last slide here to emphasize the importance of an informed choice. Interventions can, in fact, do what we intend them to do, but often will have clinically significant risks. And these types of risks that are characterized here have been seen with interventions that are rare disease setting interventions. And they're indirect negative effects, <coughs> disinhibition. In a, in a PKU patient, if we, in fact, effectively address plasma P concentrations, do we, in fact, induce less attention to dietary restrictions that, in fact, offset some of that clinical benefit. There may be inconvenient schedules. These are typically extremely costly interventions. We may, in fact, by giving a person a therapy that's not as effective, be reducing the likelihood that they would be getting access to something that is. So all of these are issues that point out that if we have an intervention that is biologically active, but doesn't, in fact, ultimately directly influence what a patient would identify they care about, functions, feels, survives, then we would be, in fact, not serving that patient well. And so how do we go about, even in a rare disease setting, addressing the patient's true needs, which are to get them not just choices, but to give them in information required so that they and their caregivers can make an informed choice about whether to use the therapy. So in closing, I want to, in advance, Thank all of you who are going to be here. These are very difficult, challenging issues, but uh, it's, it's through the pursuit of these and understanding through an array, I think what I'm very impressed with today is we're going to look at a wide array of different real world scenarios and ultimately, hopefully, advance the field toward getting more timely access to effective therapies for patients in rare disease. Thanks.